Okay, so recording this and uh, sometime over the course of today, I will get it uploaded to the cloud and get it to your webmaster and it will be on your on your website. Um, we'll be putting your question when you um, have questions, put them into chat. Uh, Sandy will be stopping occasionally to take them there. Tammy will read the questions. <laughs> and uh, some of you have microphones open and with this many people here, that's a problem. So please give yourselves now if you're not Sandy. Up to 27. Sandy, okay, good. You guys are doing an excellent job here. All right, <clears throat> Sandy, I think we have most of the people here. Uh, I'll let other people uh, in as they show up, uh, but let me uh, introduce you. I don't have to introduce you. They know you better than I do. Uh, let me just hand the microphone over to you and let you begin your program. Alan, I'm actually gonna make a few announcements first. Okay, sorry, sorry, Tammy, take over. I'll shut up. That's okay. Well, good morning, everyone. So happy to see so many of you back with us. Yes, I like the waves. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, I do send, I, or I did send out the link to everyone, and I would just ask you to check your, um, maybe your junk mail folders if you don't see it right away. Um, I'll send it out once again this week. Um, to make it easier. And we would like to ask everyone to uh, try to check in um, maybe a little bit earlier so we don't bombard Alan all at once and, and delay our speaker getting started. So because we do have several uh, first time uh, visitors with us, they just missed one class, but we wanna welcome you and tell you a little bit about the class. This class is put on by uh, Tampa Audubon Society. And um, if you don't know much about us, you, you should, because we have a lot of fun. We are involved in birding and conservation. And um, if you are not a member, we'd love to have you. We have uh, fun meetings and we do field trips. So we would just uh, like to welcome you and um, let us know if you're interested. In our website, where you can see some of the things we're involved in, is uh, Tampa Audubon at, okay, help me, Sandy, <laughs> Sandy or Mary, Tampa Audubon, uh, what's our website, at, um, or dot net. I'm sorry, I'll get that for you later. I thought I knew that by heart. www.tampaaudubon.org. Dot org, okay, thank you. I'll put it in the, in the chat box so everybody can find it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so our speaker today is um, Sandy Reed. Um, Sandy joined Tampa Audubon Society in 2009 and served as vice president from 2014 to 2018. She's been the bird protection committee chair since 2013. She started the Hooked Bird Initiative in collaboration with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Com Commission, Audubon, Florida's Coastal Island Sanctuary, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and other organizations. Her most recent conservation project attempts to protect and restore burrowing owls to Hillsborough County. She participates in Colony Watch and Eagle Watch and has monitored bluebird trails for over 20 years. Uh, Sandy is an avid bird watcher and she wants to share her addiction as she calls it, which it is to her, <laughs> with others showing people the beautiful birds they can attract to their yards. Sandy. Um, hi everyone. And I thank you all for my on here. There we go. Thank you all for, um, signing up for the class. Um, and I hope that you'll get something out of the class that you can enjoy or in use or use in your own yard. Um, I want to say uh, I, I've always loved birds and being outside. And um, many of you know, when you're raising kids and working, uh, sometimes that doesn't, you don't get to develop all your hobbies. <laughs> 
um, as well as you would like. But after I retired, I, I thought I'm going to go to one Audubon event per month, you know, a field trip or a, a program. And, and of course, that's turned into something I do every, every day now. So um, just be prepared that it, it's an addicting hobby. But Florida is the best place to be looking for birds. Um, you know, we have the beautiful birds that are here year round um, that, that morph into their, their breeding plumage. So you get to see that, but then we have these wonderful waves of migration that pass through in the spring and the fall. And um, I, um, I, I, I was traveling all over with Audubon to go to field, on field trips to go see birds at Circle B and Merritt Island and, and Naples. I was going all over and um, my mother came to live with us and uh, was suffering from severe dementia. And she used to be a, um, a, a bird watcher. And um, so I just put up a feeder for her and even though her language was extremely impaired, um, I came home one day and she was sitting on the porch watching the feeder I had put up. And she said, there's a red and black and white bird on the feeder. And um, it turns out it was a rose-breasted grosbeak. So I said, whoa. So then I started putting up more feeders and more feeders beget more feeders and, and then um, I, I appreciated how the birds in this dry season, especially now, really appreciate water and, and some plants. So it, it just grew from, from there. It just kind of gradually grew as, as you'll find it does. I, I don't know too many people that just have one feeder anymore, at least not my friends. They kind of pile them on. But anyway, I hope you'll get something you can learn from this and I will um, just glad to see you here, and um, I just figure that that the birds need all the help that they can get. Their under their populations are under pressure. All the development is 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 um, is is ruining their ha available habitat, and so I think you do them a a great service um, to to set your your own yard up to uh, attract birds and. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll get, get started. I, at the end of each little section, we'll stop and Tammy will uh, uh, read off questions if, if you have any. So, um, okay, so Alan, I'm gonna share my screen now. Where did Alan go? <laughs> there he is. Well, I'll share my screen. I guess as I'm doing something wrong, he'll hop in there. Oh, there he is. So Alan, I'll share my screen. That, that should work. Okay. And slideshow and from beginning. So can everybody see that okay? Well, I guess yep. they can't hear me yes. talking or I can't yes. hear them, but um, birding your backyard, bringing the birds to you. And um, this is one of the many bird baths I have in my yard and my bird baths, I use that term very loosely because a lot of them are just saucers, saucers on the ground or a little dish hanging in a tree. And um, um, uh, anyway, the little birds like like shallow shallow water, but this this uh, red shouldered hawk is gonna is gonna do it here. So anyway, to start to create a bird friendly yard. Um, the, the first ingredient really is having some, some native plants and, um, um, and why, why go native? Um, this is a beautiful black-throated blue warbler eating uh, beauty berry and native plants are, um, attract more uh, local birds and, and native insects. Um, they tend to be water efficient and um, are adapted to local conditions. Um, one of the best native plants for attracting birds are oak trees because they attract 534 species of caterpillars that a lot of birds, uh, um, a, lo a lot of birds, especially warblers will, will, um, will feed on. So um, 
I just want you to be inspired. I, I, had, I had a yard that was very not native and I'm gradually converting um, the, the plants to, to native plants, but they tend to grow slower. So I do fill in with tropical plants. I spent a lot of time in the Caribbean and I like tropical plants, but they'll freeze out. Whereas our native plants tend to come back Okay, like this, this bird is a cedar waxwing on a native mulberry tree and many of, and thank you Sandy Townsend for this beautiful photo of a cedar waxwing. And the cedar waxwings are, are here now. I just saw a flock of them the other day that flew through and um, um, native mulberry trees are available at uh, uh, local nurseries. There, there is a non-native, uh, mulberry tree that I'll warn you about that has bigger, le larger leaves and tends to be more invasive, but these um, native mulberries are um, very appealing to a, a lot of birds. Um, this uh, is a Swainson's thrush that comes through in the fall. And, and what I'm focusing on, there's a vine growing up the tree. Oh, you know what? I meant to put on the the laser pointer, let me see, laser pointer. There, can everybody, I, I have a little red dot here that I'll use as a pointer. But up here in the, entangled in the um, oak tree is a uh, Virginia creeper and it becomes loaded with berries. And in the fall, these swains and warblers come through and they they just cover the, the um, the Virginia creeper, and um, and and so I'm one of the ones when I'm buying plants in the nursery. I'm always looking for a little piece of Virginia creeper that got stuck in the in the pot. But anyway, many of the birds don't come to a feeder, but they enjoy eating fruiting fruiting plants and berries. Um, these are some native plants I have in my yard. This wonderful salvia right here. Um, in this top left is the tropical sage and it, um, it recedes itself and, and I have it growing up through a lot of my plants. It can get very tall or you can keep it short, but it will recede and come back. I love this plant below it with the hummingbird on it is coral honeysuckle. And that more than anything else forms a nice um, hedge or covers a, a, a wire trellis and, and tends to be more evergreen, even when it gets, even when it gets very cold, it tends to keep the leaves on the tree. So I love that, or on the shrub. So I love that. The one in the middle here is coral bean and um, the hummingbirds love that. Um, right below is more um, coral honeysuckle and you can see it can form a big, a huge, um, a huge, bush of coral honeysuckle, or you can keep it trained to a, a trellis. Up here in the top right, you can see more of the uh, Virginia creeper that I love. And then right down below that is um, a native fire bush with butterflies on it. And the butterflies love it, the hummingbirds love it, and um, it also gets berries, berries on it if the trees, uh, um, if the flowers become pollinated, they'll form little berries. So there's a lot of birds that love that. And um, here I wanted to show you, uh, sometimes uh, the birds are, uh, the birds, the plants are labeled as Florida friendly and that doesn't necessarily mean native. And I'm not, I'm not a purist, but um, I, I do have Florida friendly in my yard just so they attract caterpillars. And you can see this caterpillar up here in the top left. That's on, um, sometimes it's called a senna or a cassia. It attracts all these sulfur butterflies and the, 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 the shrub that can, you can keep it as short shrub or it'll get very tall. Um, you, I have it trained to go over, the, over a path so the birds have a little tunnel to, to fly through, but anyway. This is a great plant because lots of butterflies come and lots of caterpillars and, um, and, and the warblers especially love it. Um, 
down below here is my, my special bird. I probably had 150 people come to see this bird. I looked out my window one day last October and here was this Bullock's Oriole that hadn't been seen on the west coast of Florida since 1999 and that was up in Cedar Key. And I, I felt very blessed that I, I wasn't feeling very well and couldn't go birding at the time. And here right outside my window on a Turk's cap, which is, there are some, um, some uh, species of Turk's cap that are considered more native. One is, uh, one is a, um, like a pendulous one that hangs down. This one is pendulous and others that, that go up, but they look like hibiscus that don't open. Um, but anyway, here was this Oriole. And if you can see, he's got the he's biting the calyx and he's getting into the nectar at the at the base of that flower and and he was here for hours just drilling into the base of that uh turks cap so i can't tell you how much i love turks cap now you know you could tell if you see my yard um and then up here this one is also not a native i think it's called bloom sedge but you can see there's an oriole a lot of birds like um um, like the nectar. So they're attracted to these plants. Um, let's see. Okay. So before I start on the water, does anybody have questions about uh, some of the plants that they want answered? I, Joel is going to go into this much more in depth, but I just wanted to see some of my favorites around my yard. Tammy, any questions? Andy? We do have a question and I had just commented that our native mulberry is the red mulberry. So please, if you wanna plant mulberries, which they are good for wildlife, plant that one. And Turks cap mallow is um, considered Florida friendly as Sandy was saying. So our question is, um, what species of butterflies lay their eggs which turn into caterpillars on the live oak trees? Um, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I imagine there's a lot of them. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of moths also, you know, yeah. that are good protein meals for um, um, uh, birds. But I, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you specifically what, um, what caterpillars turn into butterflies on, on oak trees. I'm sorry, but that's something I'll, I'll look into in the future. If you have a particular butterfly that you're interested in, you could always Google the information on its life cycle. So I don't know that one either, but if, um, if Mary or Anne know, know the answer to that, maybe you could um, let us know or type it in. Well, and, and also um, the, the UF Extension Office on, on, a, um, on 579 there in North, in, in North Brandon, or I guess that's Sefner, um, they have a lot of information on, um, on native plants and um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Um, food sources for, you know, um, larval, lar larval food is what I'm trying to think of, you know, where the, the, they'll tell you what butterflies lay their eggs on certain plants. And so even if they don't flower, even if the plants aren't flowering, they're attracted to uh, certain plants by their scent just to lay their eggs. Sandy, I'm going to put the phone number for the extension office in the chat box. Okay. Um, they, they're not in the office every day, but they are answering all kinds of questions. They do have lists of native plants, butterfly plants, um, things like that. And Joanne Hoffman, one of the specialists there may well be able to answer the question about the, uh, the caterpillar on the oaks because I don't know either, but I'll put that all in the chat box. Thank you. If you, if you could also, uh, if you can remember it, which I couldn't this morning, but if you could put their web address in there, because uh, the extension service is really a wealth of knowledge there. And I have to say, Joel is going to be giving his presentation later on in the series. 
and Joel is the is the, a, a master at native plants and has a, so much information. You know. Okay, we're ready to move on to water. Water's the other main attractant for these birds, especially this time of year when it's so dry. Um, I don't have, you know, it seemed like the beginning of, of May towards the end of April, a lot of my birds that were here for the winter are gone and, and I don't have the number of birds um, that I had all winter. But you have these wonderful birds that hang around all year, like up here in the top, the red-bellied woodpecker. He's just hanging on a little dish that I have uh, with water. Here, the bluebirds bring their whole family to the to the um, to the watering trough. Here, um, the red-shouldered hawks don't 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 miss coming to the bird bath. And here's just some other. Um, uh, uh, someone named Sue Tess over in Pinellas, she sent me a picture of her uh, little PVC dripping water um, feature that, um, that, that attracts birds to her yard. But anyway, the birds really like the water, whether they come to your feeder or not. Um, here are different um, water features. This is just a rock, uh, a, a little rock um, water feature, and this happens to have a, a scrub jay there. Um, this is this the picture to the right. My friend has a little pond with, with some lake lettuce in it, and there's a bird bath. You never know what you're going to get. You know, my friend went out and had a screech owl in her bird bath, you know, early in the morning, and, and I myself have walked out early in the morning when it's just barely dawn and um, that doesn't happen real often, but I've caught barred owls sitting on my bird bath in the morning. In fact, I startled them, they like fell off the bird bath. But um, here's, uh, you know, just our local cardinal that's, that's taken a bath just in this, you can see it, this bird bath was not expensive. And every, every bird that passes through my yard has to come get in it anyway. Um, here's more bathing beauties. And you can see here, this is just a saucer on the ground. It happens to have a rose-breasted grosbeak who normally is here for migration, uh, just passes through in the spring and the fall. But this little lady decided to stay all winter and I was glad to get her picture in the bird bath. And I, I, I zoomed back uh, to see, uh, to try to get a bigger picture of, of where she was and just how Un, um, uh, unglamorous this bird bath is. And there was the Bullock's Oriole, my, my special bird waiting his turn to get in this stupid, just, just saucer, not, not high tech bird bath on the ground. He, these black and white warblers, I know these are Anne's favorite. And, and when you see them on a tree trunk, they're practically invisible. The, they blend right in, but, um, this little guy would come nearly every day to the to the bird bath, and when they land on your bird bath, they are absolutely neon. and And I have my um, my window looks out. I've I've trimmed the bushes and and clean windows. I even get some good friends to clean my windows sometimes, <laughs> so that I can get a clear shot of what's going on in the bird bath. Here's a catbird in the blue, in the in that same saucer. Here's another yellow-throated warbler. I mean, everybody comes through. Here's a perula over here. Linda Bennett took this photo of a black and white with a perula uh, waiting to get waiting her turn. Um, the bird in the bottom right is a uh, is a western tanager that I've been fortunate enough to have for the last four years. Um, also a Western bird that's not supposed to be here that, um, you know, I'm just very happy to see him. And uh, someone pointed out to me that he returned the same day this year as, uh, or last November, as he did the year before. So it's amazing what, what birds, uh, the, the sight fidelity that they have, you know, they'll come back again and again. And, um, and also the, the, clock in their head, their biological clock, 
you know, that he would arrive the same day is pretty amazing to me. And um, I don't know what this draw, these blue lines are that just appeared on my presentation. But anyway, I'm just showing you more birds to come through. This top left picture is a summer tanager. I don't see him at a feeder very often, but here he is in the bird bath. Here's a bluebird in the bird bath. Here's my Western tanager again. And then here down below is um, a, a perula with a chipping sparrow waiting to get in. So um, I, there's just, I, you don't need to get a fancy waterfall or water feature. Um, just one that has a little protection. Um, the, these have oak, oak trees that are growing all around it. And, and I do have crepe myrtles that kind of form a big screen. I don't, I don't cut my crepe myrtles, but they, they form a nice um, kind of a, a nice open screen around the yard, it makes it harder for the hawks to dive through the trees to get to the bird baths. Okay, here, just more birds, just to show you what you get here. This is a, a American red start female that's also come down to this, this terrible, awful saucer on the ground, but they love it. Great crested flycatcher. I was just looking at him. They're they're here now, and they make a visit to the bird bath every day. And, and those are birds you don't usually see at the feeder. Here's my um, my my bullock's oriole that's also in that saucer on the ground. And here's a black throated blue that just happened to pass through about two weeks ago. I looked out, and there he was, just sitting on the bird bath. So. Um, I'm, I'm just really grateful to these birds that they decide to show up in my yard, but they, they all like the water. Okay, any, um, any, any bird, any water questions, Tammy? We, we do. Uh, let me get up here. Um, so Mary has, um, and I'm talking about Mary Keith, our current Tampa Audubon uh, president and she worked at the extension office for years so she has a lot of uh, knowledge so she put a note up here with the extension office's phone number please read that and um, she told you who to ask for uh, Joanne Hoffman and she put the link to the extension service and she also comments that another great source is the Audubon Plants for Birds website, and she gives you the um, web address for that. Okay, so um, our first question um, is from Peter and Leslie. How far away should the bird bath be from your house? Well, I have them right outside my window. I have them right up next to my screen. I, I tend to put them under shrubs where the birds feel like they're um, a little protected. Um, right now I'm just looking out and I see a little ground dove that's just jumping into the bird bath. Um, but I have them pretty close and I situate them where I can see them. So um, I think you can, you can, mine are all pretty close. Mine are all within probably 10 feet of my house. So um, that's just because I wanna see the birds. But, but just remember to put it in a little bit of a sheltered area. You know, you don't wanna put a, a bird bath out in the middle of your yard with, with no protection around it because the hawks will pick them off and then you'll feel really guilty. And, um, um, and also just, just know it doesn't have to be any, anything fancy. Um, but some people do, I mean, that's my dream is to make a little slow moving water feature um, that the birds can come to, but I, I do, we wash out these bird baths every, every morning and, and the birds wait for us to change the water. They really do. They, they're sitting in the bushes and the trees above the bird bath waiting for us to clean it out. So, um, they appreciate a clean bird bath. I was trying to think if there was something else I wanted to mention about them, but I can't think. Anyway, um, just, go on just, with our, but oh, I was going to, I was going to say, we'll go on with our questions and that may prompt okay. you if there's anything else. Um, 
So the next question, are birds likely to come into a yard for water if there are ponds close by? Um, I, I, I believe that they do because there are, there are retention ponds all around my neighborhood, but they tend to be um, mowed to the edge. The, the HOAs remove all the vegetation around the edge of the pond. Any bird that would go down to the, to the edge of one of those retention ponds is a, is a sitting duck, so to speak, because they have no, no protection just because of the way the HOAs manage, manage their ponds. So that, that's gonna be actually the next topic is what you can do to help your pond if, if you, have, you live on a pond. Okay, yeah, so I, I think Sandy um, is correct. It's all about the um, cover and shelter uh, for the birds. So to make your area inviting, like she says, she puts hers kind of under some plants or where they feel like they're protected. Um, so the next question, you might've already answered this one. Do you fill the baths daily? Yep, we clean them out every morning. We clean them out every morning because there's a lot of wildlife in my area too. And I have some a raccoon family. And even though um, a lot of times they drive me crazy and, and I, I watch them on my security cameras at night and they, they have a great time in the bird bath. So, you know, they're rolling around in the bird bath and then they roll around in the mud and then they get back in the bird bath. So by the morning, my bird baths are pretty, um, pretty, they need squirted out. So if you don't have that problem, I guess you don't have to squirt them out, but but also for mosquitoes and stuff in the summer, I, I squirt them out. And, and as I said, the birds wait for me to fill them up. They really do, I've seen that and that's amazing. You see them all kind of hiding amongst the leaves of the shrubs and the plants, waiting for her to get done with the food and the, the water. Um, so the next question is, um, you just answered to how often do you change the water? So she answered that with every day. Um, let's see. And Mary Keith that I was just talking about says, I find I have to empty my baths every night because the raccoons get into them. They turn them over and make messes in them. So yes. They do. Uh, it's a very, yeah. Very good idea to uh, clean them out daily because they, the raccoons, could spread di diseases. And um, Stephen Rickert says the rocks in my bird bath are growing algae. Can I treat them with bleach, rinse them, and put them back? Um, I I have read of other things that people use, vinegar and less, less, less caustic things than bleach, but I use bleach and, and I haven't noticed any ill effects from that. The birds keep coming back and, you know, and I rinse it out really well, but in the summer you'll, you know, with the heat and the sun, your bird baths can get really yucky pretty quick. So to me, bleach, Bleach Tylex is um, it, it's a staple here at my house to to clean them quickly. If if I may jump in again, bleach is a very good idea. It's the best thing um, for killing diseases. And out in the sun, it breaks down into table salt, so it's not not going to be toxic. Um, and a little bit of algae in the rocks, on the rocks, Stephen, is not going to be a problem. Uh, you know, if it gets really super slimy, then yeah, but um, some of the birds will eat the little insects that are in the algae too, so. Um, yes, and Stephen says, I use vinegar on the bowl, but doesn't work with rocks. And I would um, second what Mary says that, um, some algae that might attract other invertebrates or you know things that um, then that they that will get the birds interested there too so um, but it's, like she said um, if it's slimy then definitely 
but that's good to know about the bleach that it breaks down to be harmless. So uh, that's something I learned today. Um, and um, Anne commented that not all caterpillars are butterflies, some are moths. True. Okay, so that is all the questions we have for that section. Okay, next, are you on a pond? And, and many people are on a pond. And I, I don't think Lois got to, um, um, it, I don't think she's in this, in this class. I think she had something else to do, but she's, she's one who decided to, uh, uh, she and her husband should take over the management of their neighborhood pond. And they've done a, a great um, deal of work trying to plant natives in their pond and um, to, to attract uh, birds and to provide shelter. And one of my favorite plants, and I don't know the, the technical name, Tammy, you might know the scientific name, but one of my favorite plants is Spatterdock. And um, it, it's not invasive. It will spread slowly, but there are so many, um, I, I think it does a good job at, at filtering water that, especially in a neighborhood retention pond where you might get more um, more runoff of, of fertilizer, you know, the spatter dock can clean some of that out. And um, also little, uh, little chinopods, snails, uh, baby fish, all that can, can be right under the surface and be protected on those, on the spatter dock. And as you can see here, up here in the upper left is a uh, purple gallinule and they love spatter dock. They, they love the flowers. And I don't have any pictures here of the flowers, but there's a spatter dock has a red, uh, a yellow ball flower that doesn't open, but these birds love them. And as you can see, they just walk right across the surface. Here's a, a little baby purple gallinule. Look at these legs, are they so cute? But just, they just walk across the surface of the spatter dock. Here you can see at the bottom, there's a, a killdeer. And if you look right in front of the adult, there's a little baby killdeer that's just right sheltered under the, um, uh, under the spatter dock leaf. So he's protected. And over here, here is a, a black neck stilt that's got its legs, uh, it's got its eggs right on the edge of, uh, a muddy pond amongst the spatter dock. So I can't say enough for spatter dock. I love spatter dock. If you can talk to your neighborhood association, get them to put some in and stop spraying all the uh, vegetation in their pond. Unfortunately, a lot of people like that, that look with no uh, vegetation around the edge of the pond. They cut down all the trees around the pond and um, um, that's that's not really a very natural or protective setting for the birds. And and I think if they had more vegetation, maybe they would choose to go to a pond rather than um, your backyard bird bath. But um, that's that's what happens. But anyway, there's spatter dock, my favorite. Um, um, and the and the plants in the ponds provide a lot of um, shelter and nesting areas for the, this is a least bitter. And, um, you know, it was, this picture was taken down at Twin Lakes at the end of Bloomingdale. Um, I'm working with them right now because they have new management, uh, land management company who's decided to spray all the spatter dock. They, you know, they killed all the plants in their lake practically. And, and, and they seem to think they have a lot of birds. They have enough birds because it's full of grackles. You know? But we've lost a lot of these beautiful birds, this least bitter and that's so, people would kill to see a least bitter. And then this, this bird was like right in front of a bench where you could sit and watch them. And here, uh, over here on the right lower, you can see that the, the least bitter and had, had chicks that at a nest in, in this uh, rush that was there in the pond. So these are, are good plants that provide shelter and nesting area. Um, up here at the top are um, um, Wilson snipe 
And they also will uh, uh, nose around and, and poke around in muddy banks. Um, but you can't you can't spray all the you can't spray all the plants. And what's happened at Twin Lakes also is they've they've sprayed all the plants that hold the uh, the banks and the berms together. So where where they had little elevated levels of of uh, banks and mud where the birds could um, could rest and forage out away from the the sh the shore of the lake. Anyway, all all that all that dirt has just kind of melted back into the bottom of the lake because there's no plants to to hold it in place. But anyway, um, the na the the plants in your pond can really um, um, enhance the wildlife that's attracted there. In fact, Lois said she she's now has because they've planted more plants out there. They now have sandhill cranes that are nesting in their lake and a lot of ducks that come to, you know, hide their babies under spatter dock. Anyway, just another thought. Okay, any any questions about ponds? Um, we do have some comments. So I just wanted to add that um, spatter dock is native and I put the scientific name if anybody cares, New Far Ludia. Um, so Sandy Townsend says, I put bird baths next to a little waterfall. The waterfall motion and sound attracts birds to the bird bath, the waterfall, in the waterfall. Um, and Janet Bergeron asks, do you know of any restrictions on HOAs killing grasses in ponds? Um, I've have watched to... bird families, uh, bird families, no longer seen the families and young after spraying. So I think you just addressed that. Do you wanna yeah, add, you add just, anything? Yeah, I think you just have to work with your own HOA and see what they'll allow you to do. Um, Twin Lakes concerns me because it was a mitigation pond, which meant it was a, it was a natural lake to begin with. And there are certain uh, requirements and restrictions about uh, plants that they can, spray and how and and removing native plants but um i don't think that they've done that they 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 haven't done that so i'm trying to get somebody to go out there and 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 look at the lake somebody from uh epa to say this is a mitigation lake and there are are certain um certain um uh, rules and uh restrictions about managing mitigation lakes but a lot of your ponds, your retention ponds, are not are not mitigation lakes, and so what goes on there uh, will depend on on what your HOA um, will will tolerate. But you know, any any native plants that you can plant even around the edges and try to get them not to not to mow right to the edge if you're if you're putting plants around a pond. Anything. Sandy Townsend adds at that a drip um, attracts birds to the bird baths also. Yep. Yeah. I don't, I don't have that, but I've seen that on a lot of videos where they have like drips, drippers for hummingbirds. But um, one, one more thing about water is a lot of times when I'm filling my bird baths, especially when it's hot and dry like this, I will also spread, use the hose and spray the oak trees and the shrubs around there. And you'll see little hummingbirds and little birds that won't come down to the bird bath, but they'll actually take uh, little baths in the leaves of the trees. You can just see them splashing around. So I would like to add that um, some of your ponds are stormwater ponds. And the purpose of a stormwater pond is to hold the water, but it's also to treat the runoff from the roads around your houses. And plants are planted there for that very reason. Um, they have changed things recently and they're not always putting plants in them. That's a whole different engineering situation I won't get into, but I think most of the existing ones should have plants and have a um, what's called a littoral zone or a shallow shelf 
or the plants can get rooted there and uh, work to take those pollutants out of the water. So you could mention that to your um, HOAs and just tell them you don't like that sterile pond. It, you know, it's supposed to be treating your stormwater. And um, Mary Keith, again, she's a wealth of knowledge. And she says, if you call the extension office and ask for Paula, or the person who works with the HOA, she might know what the restrictions are or are not. So that's a really good resource for those of you um, wanting to um, find out more about what you can do to help your stormwater pond. Paula at um, the University of Florida Extension Office and Mary has put the phone up in the chat earlier. Yeah, and the, the extension office actually, I think it's still Paula, um, has a grant to work with homeowners associations on Florida friendly landscaping. So that would include the ponds as well as um, as well as the the other landscaping. Right. So, and um, I, Stephen had asked about regulation mm -hmm. or resources for um, for mitigation lakes or stormwater ponds. So I, Mary just answered that. Right. And you can get information through the EPA, too. There's a guy there that 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 will do inspections on mitigation ponds and they're they're supposed to uh, inspect them every five years. But if they're in a private neighborhood, they need the community to invite them in to inspect it. So just seems, um, doesn't seem like that's working very well, but anyway, um, there it is. The EPA has, has rules there that, that you could look up on their site about mitigation management. So that's okay. actually, that's actually Hillsborough County's Environmental Protection Commission. And, oh, and, you. And adds that the county has an adopt a pond program. So that would be good to look into also. They'll probably have you monitoring that. That would be great. Okay, that's all questions and comments. Okay. Um, next, uh, next attractant are bird houses and nest, box, nest boxes. And they make up for loss of habitat you know the birds use them for nesting for night roosts and for shelter this little uh, downy woodpecker is in a bluebird box and he never nests in there but in the winter he goes in there at night at night uh, he, uh, and i i wasn't familiar with that behavior about woodpeckers but he goes into he would go into the bluebird box at night here this this box here with the pileated it was in Mary Keith's yard. And I think that was a kestrel box, wasn't it, Mary? Or a, a screech owl box? Yes, it was put up uh, for screech owls. Um, but this um, pileated woodpecker seems to like it. It's not uh, not labeled. So, um, and, and the other thing I was gonna say, like in my neighborhood, they have destroyed practically every, every um, every wooded section of, uh, of, of property, you know, that it just gets mowed down and people are, are only too anxious to cut down dead trees and snags. And I know that they present a safety hazard, but if you have dead trees and snags in your yard that can be saved or trimmed so that they're not 30 feet tall, I mean, the birds really appreciate those um, those shelters, if you can leave some boxes uh, or some um, snags un uncut. And, and also something else that someone mentioned, I remember when I took a bat, a bat class, they were saying that the, the leaves that fold down from the palm trees really shouldn't be trimmed off. And then a lot of bats will, will nest um, in those, in those, those palm fronds that are folded down against the trunk. Um, here is uh, more, uh, it's surprising what, you'll never know what you find in a bluebird box. Um, and, and I want you to see this, this box up at the left shows how most of my boxes are situated. They, there's a box, 
there's a predator guard and you can't see it in this picture so much, but there's a little metal um, disc around the, the opening so that woodpeckers can't enlarge the hole on a bluebird box and make their nest in it. Some, some of the boxes I have uh, guards on and some I don't, but anyway, you can't, this picture doesn't show it anyway. In the, in the opening of that, of that box is a frog. <laughs> so anyway, the frogs will use your bluebird boxes. Down here is a, is a baby bluebird that's just hatching on, on eggs in a bluebird box. Up here in the top middle, those are uh, red-bellied woodpeckers in a bluebird box that I didn't put a, a metal guard on. And um, they look like pterodactyls, don't they? But, um, and, and something I, I realized too is that um, woodpeckers don't bring nesting material into a box. They carve out the side of your box. So uh, they, they will destroy your box over time. But I kept brushing the sawdust out of the bottom of the box only to realize when I finally left it that they just, the red-bellied woodpeckers just lay their eggs right on top of the sawdust. So there's no fancy nest. Um, here, my friend Susie painted her bluebird box and there's a little face in there. She got bluebirds regularly. Over here are Mexican free-tailed bats uh, in the upper right who've also commandeered a bluebird box. And I'm happy for anybody who wants to use the bluebird box, except for English house sparrows. Uh, anybody else, titmice, chickadees, anybody else who want gray-crested flycatchers, I, I don't care about other birds using the boxes except for English house sparrows because they are uh, an invasive species and they're very aggressive and they will, if if they decide to nest in your yard, they'll they'll pull the baby bluebirds out of the box and throw them on the ground or they'll kill them. And um, so I don't, I don't tolerate um, English house sparrows in my bluebird boxes. Um, anyway, here's just other uh, nest box examples. Here's a little chickadee in a tiny little box. Someone gave me a gourd and um, here's a titmouse going into a gourd. Here's a couple of, um, of uh, Carolina wrens that are, are thinking about building a nest in there. And then what they did actually is they built a nest right in this little uh, woven uh, nest. I don't know, what do, you, what do you want to call it? A little nest box that I have right by my front door. And they, they've repeatedly laid their eggs in there. And then the parents go up and spend the night in the box or in the, in the light over top of this box. But anyway, um, and like I said, this, this one little woven box is right outside my front door. And I usually put them pretty close to the house so I can, so I can watch them coming and going. Um, here's somebody else who had screech owls in their backyard. And look, they had a little uh, um, triplets. Janet Kirk is down in Naples, but I just thought that was the cutest picture of the triplet owls, uh, screech owls out of her nest box in her backyard. Um, and then one more thing about nest boxes, bluebirds are so engaging and uh, Mary Keith, I think is gonna be doing a program on bluebirds, but they're, they're just so engaging. And if, you, if the habitat is right in your yard, they like open spaces like pastures or a clear front yard. And and they will uh, they don't they don't need a five acre pasture, but they they do need an opening without shrubs underneath. And so here's a male bluebird on the top of the box with a with a bug. Here to the right, he's flying in to the box. There the parents are on the top with the little baby in the cavity. There's the babies peeking out, and there's mom coming in with food. So. It's so fun if your area um, um, is is good for a bluebird box. And there's a lot of information on the Tampa Audubon page about um, bluebirds and bluebird boxes. The North American Bluebird Society has a lot of information. And um, it's basically, you know, whether you get bluebirds or not, it just, uh, 
it depends on, on your exact habitat where you want to put it. You know, you may have a, a heavily treed backyard, but you may have a very open front yard. You just have to be sure that you don't spray. Uh, you don't want to spray the bugs that these birds are going to feed to their babies. Um, other types of nest boxes, and, and Tammy mentioned that we're starting a burrowing owl project. Uh, burrowing owls used to be very prominent in this part of, of the country uh, on Christmas bird counts back in 1980s. Uh, this area had more burrowing owls than any place in the country. Um, on this last Christmas bird count, we had none. Um, so we're trying to do uh, uh, a project here where we plant artificial burrows. Here you can see the end of the burrow sticking up. And um, these owls are not from ours. I, I would love to, to, to see them and hope we can um, grow some owls in our burrows. But anyway, if you are, if you have a ranch, you don't, um, and, and an open cattle pasture or whatever, um, you, you could uh, look into putting a burrow in your yard. This, this burrow helps, um, won't be crushed. If there's cattle, if there's cattle or horses out there, they can't crush this burrow. Also, uh, gopher tortoises can't, big ones can't go down there and, and wreck the burrow. And, and these don't flood either. Sometimes in our heavy rains, burrows will flood. So this is a program that um, you can contact me about if you're interested in being part of it, or if you have, um, um, you, you think you have the right habitat for a burrowing owl, or even if you see a burrowing owl, um, I'll just explain a little more about our project. Um, we had passed these flyers out to everyone. We started doing this in neighborhoods along Big Bend because that's the last historic place that we really found burrowing owls. And that's been almost 10 years. Um, so we were handing out these flyers to all the people in that neighborhood. But then um, COVID hit and you weren't going to people's front doors. But this is uh, a flyer that we were handing out to people to call us if they um, if they saw a burrowing owl so that we could come try to put in an artificial burrow so that if if the burrow that the owls were in was damaged or destroyed um, they uh, they would have a burrow to go to that wasn't collapsed so um, anyway and and I'm not sure on this number uh, we're trying to see if we can renew this number uh, to continue it because Finally, after two years, we have we have an owl out in Waimama that has moved into one of our artificial burrows. So uh, anyway, it's just another form of, of nest box that you can put up. Here is the owl, if you can see him up there right next to a strawberry field. Um, Mr. Sizemore um, moved our sign over. We put signs here to try to keep people back from walking along this fence and crushing the burrows. Here's the owl looking at us. And here's where he moved over to our, our burrow. And he's very happily goes in and out of the burrow there. So we're hoping that we'll see some babies. Um, but anyway, it's just depending on what your yard looks like. If you're a rancher and you've got this kind of uh, habitat, you may consider um, uh, contacting us about putting in um, uh, burrowing owl artificial burrows. All right, so any question about nest boxes? Yes, and I'll just add that if anyone is interested in the burrowing owl project, you should all have my email address by now. You can uh, let me know and I will send that to the appropriate person. So uh, Doug, um, says, I have a bluebird problem. One of the male bluebird regulars has decided that he wants to crash into my window repeatedly. I covered the window, but he moved over to another window. When I took the cover down, he started up again. I finally took down my mealworm feeder as that was all my bluebirds ate. That stopped him when I put it back up. This morning, he started back. All, all I can say is this is nesting season 
and, and, and a lot of birds will do that, will attack their image that they can see in, um, in a window or a, a car mirror. Somebody had called me, I think it was Susie, because her bluebird just kept sitting on her husband's rear view mirror, you know, side view mirror on the car, just pecking the heck out of it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you can do other than what you did to try to cover cover your window or maybe um, um, some of those um, bird decals that you can put on your window that that kind of um, you know prevent the birds from crashing into your windows that might deter them. Um, I, I I don't know what to tell you on a permanent basis. It sounds like you're trying all the things that you need to try to hang things up in front of the windows so they don't um, they don't see their image. I'm not I'm not sure uh, what else. I read someplace too that you could take and I haven't tried this so don't don't call me up if you can't get the marker off your window but somebody somebody told me that if you took a yellow uh, like highlighter marker and and like drew zigzags on the inside of your window that that broke up the um, what the birds see and that was good for keeping them from crashing into your window or for pecking at your window. So um, anyway, I'm sorry, I don't have more to give you there. It sounds like you're trying everything. I'm gonna suggest something then if Anne or Mary have suggestions, um, please let me know. Um, so the decal that Sandy mentioned, that's just like a black profile of a bird. And you could actually make those. And if you maybe just tape them, you know, to your window or the windows uh, close by, that might prevent them and just leave them there during nesting season. Or uh, I don't know, uh, Doug, if, um, if this happens all the time or if it's just during nesting season. So Mary and Ann, do you have any, any other suggestions for Doug? Well, I put in the, um, in the chat box, you can hang string, you know, just very fine cord up and down, up and down about four inches apart vertically um, across the, the glass. So if you're trying to take pictures, you have to angle your camera between the, the strings. Um, but that will work. Uh, it, at least it works for birds that you know are flying into the glass inadvertently. And it should help with the birds. I mean, right now it's hormones. And so they're, you know, they're viewing that reflection as an intruder in their territory. Um, and I also have, I have here, actually, I've got a few on my windows and more to put up. It's called Window Alert, W-I-N-D-O-W-A-L-E-R-T. Um, and they, they have a variety of shapes, decals. They're basically clear to us, but... Um, they show up on, under ultraviolet. And since a lot of birds see ultraviolet, which we don't, it looks very bright, um, very uh, noticeable to the birds. So this one pack that I have here are actually just in the shape of leaves, but you can get ones that are in the shapes of, of kestrels, you know, or, or possible predators, and there's a variety of other things. But if you look for window alert, window decals, um, that's another prettier option. So I was just thinking about um, Doug's um, comment that when he stops putting out the the caterpillars and so forth to feed the bluebird, he, it stops uh, attacking his window. So maybe if he moves that feeder a little bit away from the window, then the what's going on, I think, is the bluebird is defending this excellent food source and from any other bluebird males that he happens to see in his reflection. So maybe moving it a little bit away from the window will help 
him not feel so aggressive. Very good. Um, and as Sandy um, mentioned, one of our later topics given by Mary Miller is going to be all about bluebirds. So maybe Doug, you can try some of these suggestions and and um, if you have any more questions, uh, Mary Miller should be able to answer them. Okay, so now we're on to feeders and there's a lot of different things to consider about feeders. What type of bird, uh, what type of birds are coming to your area? What type of birds would you like to see? What time of year is it? Are they nesting? Are they migrating? Is it the wet or the dry season? Um, and also you always want to be sure to have predator guards on your feeders or you end up spending a lot of money feeding the squirrels. Um, and also ants are a problem. So I, I put up ant mode. So we'll kind of go through that. This bird in the upper left is my, um, my other famous bird, my Western tanager. And when he showed up four years ago, I remember when I saw him, I just went quickly to see what they would eat. I just put out everything I could possibly think of. I put out mealworms, I put out jelly, I put out chopped fruit, I put out seeds, I put out suet, I put out everything that I thought he might possibly be interested in. And as it turned out, he loved jelly and, and chopped grapes. You know? So um, I kept these, these little uh, salsa dishes I would put in a tray and would fill him up with, with jelly. And like I said, he's here in the winter. I also had other um, tanagers that love the jelly. Catbirds love the jelly. It turns out everybody really loves the jelly. Um, but the tanagers, uh, pe well, people complained that they were getting too many bees with their, um, um, with putting the jelly out. And once the tanagers come, once you get tanagers, the tanagers will eat the bees. And I know I've said to several of my friends, I think the tanagers are dipping the bees in the jelly. <laughs> That's what it looked like to me. Anyway, here's a tanager. He comes right to his jelly and, the, and he sits up in the tree and all day he just goes back and forth to the jelly. And sometimes he'll eat a little suet, but he really loves the jelly and the jelly that that I found that was most economical and pro and and I don't know if any jelly is healthy, but at 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 Costco they had a big jar of uh, wild Maine blueberry jelly and they get it in seasonally and it was uh, lower sugar and um, the the birds all tended to love the little wild blueberries that were mixed in with that jelly. Um, I have tried for years to get painted buntings to come to my yard. Um, this bird in the upper right is a painted bunting and you can obviously see why we would want him to come to our yard. And this feeder is full of white millet and they eat, they love white millet. And I've had other people say, well, will they eat something else? And, and I suppose they will, except they love white millet. So why not put out white millet? And um, so you just have to look at what kind of birds that you're trying to attract and where they like their feeders placed. You know, these little guys like them, like it in a very sheltered, they don't, they don't go to a feeder that's out in the middle of your yard. They, they really like to be undercover. Um, here I have hummingbirds. Uh, this, this happens to be a rufous hummingbird that came to, uh, my feeder a couple of years ago. I was really surprised to see them. But in the winter, I put out eight hummingbird feeders. Uh, in the summer, I just took my last one down because it's been so hot and they get full of mold. So you don't, and there's plenty of flowers out now. Um, and and it, I think the, the birds do prefer the flowers over the hummingbird feeders if they have that choice. But in the winter, you may get frost or overcast days that, um, impair flowers from, from um, you know, you don't have a real full bloom of flowers sometimes in the winter and the hummingbirds uh, will go to your feeders very regularly, but you have to keep them clean. Anyway, and then um, here's uh, bluebirds who um, love mealworms. I encourage people not to, not to just leave a big dish of mealworms out all day long. 
I, I would take my mealworms and sprinkle them on, on some of the feeders when I was going to sit out there. But I think it's important for them to, and the babies to, to learn how to, to find food besides that of mealworm feeder. Um, anyway, this is just my friend's house that has the painted buntings. I, I, I really would love to get painted buntings, but she has a, a, a privet of some size right in her front window. And she has these feeders that are full of white millet and you can just sit in her living room. Here you go, looking at her painted buntings and they come every October and they leave, I think the beginning of April. But anyway, um, thank you, Susie Meyer for sharing your painted buntings. Um, this, this was uh, birds that we went to. I, I went to a lady uh, named Billy Knight down in Palmetto and she um, has a kitchen window that looks out to a, a kind of a marshy area and she's got shrubs and bushes that are not very far from her kitchen window. And she took sprays of millet and tied it to the branches of this tree. And look, she had so many buntings out there. She had, I, I don't know, 14 indigo buntings. She had a, a bunch of painted buntings and then she also got a very unusual bird. This is a lazuli bunting that um, just showed up at her yard and stayed for a, a month or two. So it's just, I, I wanted you to see there are all kinds of ways. She, she wanted these, the millet to be close to her kitchen window. And so she just tied the sprays of millet to her, um, her shrubs and look what she got. So there's no harm in trying. Um, here, here's another uh, feeder full of, of millet. This happens to be down at Felt's Preserve, um, but the Buntings really love millet. Um, um, anyway, here's more seed eaters, uh, goldfinch in trays, um, the uh, yellow-throated warblers, they like seeds as well as jelly and as well as mealworms. Here's parrots at another at another feeder, Nande parakeets. Um, uh, generally black oil seed is is a is a favorite of, of many birds, but I find like the warblers like like this little yellow throated warbler, um, they will eat the high protein uh, sunflower seed, you know, during especially during the winter when they're getting ready to tank up and go back north. And they um, they can't crack the seed. They don't have a, a seed cracking bill like a cardinal or a, a, a bunting. And they um, so they prefer the patio blend with with just sunflower chips. The patio blend has already been hulled. So a lot of the little warblers in the winter will will take um, hulled seed if you can buy patio blend. Um, here's goldfinch, also on a Niger sock. They're the only ones that eat Niger. I used to buy big bags of Niger seed, but it's expensive. And then one day the, uh, the uh, goldfinch leave and nobody else will eat that food for a year. So you got to put it back, put it in your freezer somewhere. So I got, so I just, I just buy these socks um, and, and the goldfinch love it. Um, let me see. Um, warblers like suet and mealworms too. Here I'm just showing you some of the a pine warbler that's over there. He's got a mealworm. Um, there you can see a, a bluebird eating tons of mealworms. Here's a, a palm warbler that has mealworms. And I said I just I don't I don't often put them out in a in a feeder by themselves. I just sprinkle it on my other feeders just to um, while I'm sitting out there just a sprinkling of them. Um, and sometimes I will plant plants that get uh, caterpillars like cabbage, um, fennel, um, get caterpillars uh, at different times a year. So just more feeders. Here's a tray hopper feeder that has suet on the end. I love this suet feeder down here. It's kind of in the cage. The little birds can get in there and eat the suet. 
Here someone has a log full of like a suet butter. Uh, this bird down here, the end is a, is a cactus wren that they that loves suet. This one was out in Arizona, but it was in a friend's backyard. So um, just kind of have to find out what birds might be in your area and what you might be able to do to attract them. And eBird is a good way to look and see what birds are being seen in your area. Plus Tampa Audubon trips, if we uh, start doing field trips again, we'll give you a good clue as to what birds you might be able to find and when. Um, let me see. And then I, I just wanted to show, these are some of my feeder setups. As you can see, I have a predator guard on the feeder. I have these little red caps that are ant guards because the ants will find your feeders, find your, your seed. So uh, it's something to consider, predator guards and ant moats. Here's just another feeder set up. Um, um, so you can see how I kind of configure things. I just have them sitting around the yard so I can move around um, depending on where the sun is to, to watch birds in my yard. And I, and I put them as close as I can to where I can sit and see them. Um, and here, Sue Tess has a feeder set up. A lot of people are very creative with, with um, PVC, uh, you know, putting PVC together and creating their own kind of feeder. Um, um, and um, another thing that they love are fruit and jelly. This happens to be out in Arizona in a friend's yard is a virgin that was eating citrus. Um, here's a wren who also has come into the salsa dish for um, jelly. Here's the uh, Western tanager up here in the right. He's eating jelly, but in the other little dish over here, I have some mealworms. So there's a pine warbler eating mealworms. Here is a summer tanager who's also, he's, I think he's got, I think that's, that might be some chopped grapes or jelly, but anyway, just, just to give you some ideas, try uh, try what you can um, to, uh, you can read up on what the birds like to eat and then see if they'll eat it. Um, this is just an example of other birds that are coming to the feeders. This is the summer tanager that's molting, that molted here um, a winter or two ago. These are Baltimore Oriole females that are uh, also going down to eat jelly and fruit. You can see, look, he's got jelly on his face. Here's a tanager with, with uh, grapes, chopped grapes. And here is a palm warbler eating um, jelly. So don't, don't discount jelly. Even if you get a few bees, you know, maybe just put some out for a little while. But if you're lucky enough to get tanagers, that will keep your bees under control. And um, also hummingbird feeders. If uh, I learned from Steve Bax, if you uh, want more than one hummingbird, you have to have more than one feeder. And um, because they're very uh, um, territorial. Territorial, thank you. And, and so they will guard all the feeders they can see. And so Steve had said, Put, put one out of sight of the other, and I put them next to where I'm sitting um, so I can see them. Um, but it's true, when I had somebody say, I only ever have one hummingbird, and I, and I told her this, hang up some feeders. So she now hung up four, and then she decided she actually had four hummingbirds. So um, it's just another thought. And then where there's bird seed and birds, you will also get hawks. Here's a red-shouldered hawk who, who ate fruit out of that dish. In fact, I'm always finding my dishes scattered around the yard because the hawks and the crows will pick up the dish and deposit it somewhere, sometimes out in the pasture. Here's a cooper's hawk. They're deadly at a feeder, but that's why you don't put your feeders right out in the open. They have some, um, some cover far enough away that the squirrels can't launch to your, your feeder. But anyway, where there's bird seed, you're gonna get, get birds. And people have complained about rats in their yards, um, but um, I'll hear the barred owls out there hooting or the little screech owls out there. And um, 
I don't I, I don't store my seed outside and and so I really haven't had a lot of problems with rats. Um, anyway, and, and here on these feeders, this was a place that we visited in Arizona. And you can just see they have this big complex of feeders, but with predator guards on all of the feeders to so they're not feeding uh, squirrels and mice and things like that. So let me see, is there anything else? Um, so I, I just wanted to say, once you bring them to you, they're your responsibility. You have to keep your feeders clean. You don't wanna be attracting them and feeding them mold. Um, so rinse bird baths frequently, um, put out fresh seed, uh, check the dates on the seed. One thing that Rich and Tanya um, Crete would always say, fresh seed is everything. So always check the dates of the seed when you buy it. Be sure it hasn't been sitting in the back of a Walmart shelf for a year. Um, change your hummer, bird, hummer food frequently. I put out small chunks of suet so I don't have big chunks of suet, especially in the summer when it starts to get um, moldy faster. You know, I just put out small chunks of suet that I can add to every couple of days. Don't use pesticides in your yard or your plants or your grass. Uh, be sure you treat for ants, you know, around the bottom of the feeder. Use predator guards. If you have room in your yard to have a brush pile, the birds love brush piles and um, they'll hide in them and, um, and hunt in them. Use window protection. And I don't have a lot of information about cats indoors. Audubon has a lot of information about keeping cats indoors, but if you're gonna attract the birds, don't, don't have cats that are outside. You're just asking for trouble and you may get away with it for a little while and then, then a cat will get your bird. Plus, I, I do love cats also, and I had four cats that I kept indoors and um, the cats, that, cats that live outdoors don't tend to fare very well either. So um, anyway, this is, uh, like I said, my Bullock's Oriole again, who was uh, going up this, this tree, the oak tree in the backyard had a, a uh, what do you call it, a passion vine, a red passion vine that was going up there. And he was going around to each flower, um, um, drilling into it to get the nectar. So anyway, are there any, whoops, um, any, um, any questions? We do. Um, so Nancy asked, um, oops, I skipped one, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so Stephen asks, any ideas on pulling yard squirrels? On what? Pulling yard squirrels. He wants to get rid of his oh. yard, some of his yard squirrels. I can't advise you on that. <laughs> I can't advise you on that. I know that I had a friend recently who said she's just going to start feeding the squirrels in their own feeder but I don't think they read <laughs> and, and, and um, I think they appreciate the, their own feeder, but I, I don't think that's keeping them off her, um, off her feeders. And, and what I'm noticing right now, there's a lot of baby squirrels and the, and the older squirrels may have learned that they can't jump from my roof to the feeder, but the baby squirrels continue to try to do that. But I, I, I can't tell you what to do to eliminate your squirrels. I, I, I don't know. I, I, well, your predator I don't know. guards, your predator guards should work for squirrels, shouldn't they? They do, but you know, the plants grow around the feeders. And so you might have to keep looking um, at, at your trees and your shrubs to keep them trimmed back so that they're back 10 feet uh, from your feeder. But every once in a while, even though it's 10 feet, you'll get a flying will end a squirrel and they'll launch themselves off your, they'll just keep trying until they hit it. So. And um, do you have any suggestions? Any no. suggestions about squirrels? No, I, I really don't. I think the only thing you can do is, is just 
note where they're getting to your feeder and then try to figure out a way to make that feeder not work for them. Either move it away a little bit further from the from the oak tree or whatever it is that they're using as a as their launch site. Um, I don't have any good suggestions. When I was using having feeders, I just I just ended up putting enough seed out that the squirrels didn't get all of it and the birds got some. I get I I personally gave up, so I don't I don't have a solution. Hmm. Right. Okay, and um, Nancy Doolin um, wants to know um, on, I, I think she didn't hear all that you said about the white millet sprays at Billy's for the buntings that the buntings oh, work so well. Yeah, and, and I bought some white millet sprays. You can buy it in a bag at Walmart, but she, um, she didn't have any, um, Anyway, she just thought she would try hanging the white millet. So she she bought these sprays of white millet that come in a bag and she just tied it to the tree branches that were closest to her window. So she could stand there in her kitchen and watch all these buntings come. I, you know, I, I think I would probably stand there washing dishes all day if I lived in her house looking out that window. But yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Were you wondering where to get it? I think I, I saw it online um, through Amazon. You can buy it, and and but then I found some at Walmart. Also, I think she didn't bag. understand the the term, the term oh, spray. The, the, the sprays. Um, let me just. It was like just, a cylindrical. Yeah, they they. It's the way it's grown. Let me see. It's the way it's grown. There they are. It, it, it grows like that on a stalk. And then, you know, when they prepare it for to sell, they scrape it all off. But you can buy um, these sprays like like this. Like she's got. Does that answer your question, Nancy? It comes in a, a, a bag with these these stalks of millet that you can tie onto your branches. Yeah, Nancy, if um, if that doesn't answer your question, just um, write, you know, let us know. Go ahead and on chat what, what else you wanted to know about them. So um, Anne um, commented that the Florida Ornithological Soci Society, excuse me, has a position paper on outdoor cats that offers the scientific basis for keeping all cats inside. That is true, and um, as Sandy said, um, indoor cats live uh, easier, healthier lives. Um, Valerie Wilkerson <laughs> comments about the squirrels, get a hawk, they kill squirrels daily. So that is true. And do, um, oh, go ahead. Well, and, and also the owls, I think, get them. You know, I, I have found since I have baby squirrels out here, a lot of them, I'm finding more uh, heads and tails. So I, so that must be a hawk that gets them. I don't think an owl would leave their head or their tail, but I am finding uh, body parts on some mornings out in the yard. So uh, Sherry comments that the spray is the natural seed head for the millet. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. And that's, that's all the questions that we have. All right. Well, I, I thank you all for uh, tuning in. And I hope you're inspired to put out a feeder or a dish of, uh, a dish um, with water in it that's a little protected. Um, a lot of times I wanted to put up a, a little sign like the, the beach because a lot of times the birds will get all wet in the bird feeder and that are in the bird bath and then they'll come lay in the sun and spread themselves out just like they're going to the beach it's very cute they'll just spread out in the sun so anyway I can't tell you how much I enjoy my birds I've had a lot of people come here to see them and um and and the, the birds remember from year to year so it's only going to get better for you every year if this is your first year of trying I've been doing this now 
with consistent feeders up since since about 2009 and um you know i just get more birds every year so they tell their friends so good luck with that <laughs> trisha says um thank you sandy wonderful as always so patricia and her husband are repeat attendees they've um been to this class uh, for at least a few years, I believe. And um, some people like it so well, they just enjoy taking it over again. And um, let's see, I've got another one. Um, oh, from, from Michael. And he says, um, Sandy, it is always a pleasure to hear you speak and great to hear, hear you again. You are an inspiration. She has... <laughs> She has really gone um, all out for her birds. Um, well, and I, th I think that's about all the comments. Do you have anything else you want to add, Sandy? No, I just thank you for, for looking and, and I just want people to see these birds that are right there under their yard, uh, under their nose, in their yards. Uh, you just, you really just have to look for them. So get out there so and get looking. Let's everybody give um, Sandy a virtual hand on our under our reactions. And um, I'll just mention that, um, of course, we'll be back next week. And um, we're going to go someplace a little bit different. Um, I will be speaking on Hillsborough Habitats. And I'm going to be taking you virtually into one of my favorite places, the swamps. So uh, join us next week for that. And Anne, do you have any um, any comments or announcements? No, I just want to say thank you, Sandy, so much. And we'll see everybody um, next week and look forward to it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, all right. Sandy. Bye bye.